and yeah, that's required. Um, well, for some reason here, I'm unable to share with you this link, but that's all right. Um, technical difficulty. Uh, also, books by um, both uh, poets this evening um, are available actually still through Woodland Pattern. Um, we are still selling books. We have, we are, of course, we'll mail them to you. We also have, uh, for those of you in Milwaukee, contactless pickup a couple days a week, courtesy of our book center manager, Peter Brzezinski, um, who can be emailed for more details. Uh, it's Peter B at woodlandpattern.org. Peter B at woodlandpattern.org. Um, and um, finally, I just wanted to let you know that um, this is being recorded, um, just so you, you're aware of that. Um, do with that information what you will. But I know some folks prefer to have their video off and that sort of thing, So, um, which is, of course, great um, if that's what you would prefer. Um, so as I mentioned, I'll play back Elias's introductions. Um, so I'm going to start now with uh, his introduction for Jose Felipe Alverga and share my screen with you all and hope that you can hear this. Well, let's close this Zoom meeting. We'll close this. All right, all the things you get to see my desktop. <laughs> all right, so here's um, Elias Sepulveda. Uh, thanks, thanks again, Elias. Um, Jose Felipe Alverga writes, the fiction moves and where the absence of real reckoning leaves a space unaccommodated with the words we have for naming the exertion taking place there. Jose Felipe Alverga was born in San Salvador, El Salvador. Alverga is a professor at the University of Wisconsin, Eau Claire. The book Scenery, published by Fordham University Press, is upcoming this year. Alverga's work is heavy and episodic. Episodic, not in the sense of building anticipation. Instead, Alverga offers the, the disjointed, fragmented, the the language that is marginalized and removed by bodies of white reality. My own abuela enriched my childhood with stories of the Nahual, the shapeshifter, the fluidity in which Alverga shifts from, poem, from prose to found text to poetry is remarkable. As poet, as immigrants, these episodes must cut across imaginary borderlines and symbolic immigration checkpoints. Alverga is a necessary voice. Con mucho gusto presento al poeta Jose Felipe Alverga. And now I'll turn things over to Jose. Thank you. Here. Uh, there we go. Sorry, I'm going to do this here. Sorry about that. I was trying to get some images up here. Is that up? Yeah, okay. Um, it's funny looking at the names here. There's, there's some people who are like two to five minutes away from where I'm sitting right now. Uh, <laughs> And yet we're we're separated. Um, between the 19th and early 20th centuries, states declaring themselves too impoverished to maintain prisons and prisoners would lease out convict labor to railway and mining contractors or large plantations. The practice became especially prevalent following the Civil War. False convictions, theft of bail money, and identity fraud supplied the lease system with so-called convicts. Children often become frustrated when building on a macro scale, their, lands better suited, their hands better suited for focusing on the touch and manipulation of individual objects, can't keep pace with the vision of, for instance, a corral for their elephant or a seemingly endless highway of wooden blocks for their train. I know that children's hands have built America, its infrastructure, commerce, universities, government houses, etc. The invisibility of what transpired, which is to say not only the work, but also the death, and also all the other fidgeting and research that is the physical world of a child's body. This is all a lost opportunity for a new language, for educating parenthood, all 
unknown scenery. The least system signals a theatricality to American abolition. The staging of rights and the commitment in performance belie the reflexive self-awareness of faith in being liberal, being a people of rights, a culture of belief. While it leaves behind black and white photos scattered around archives, the transformed land, the built carceral networks squat like stumps throughout these states. The benefit and the reward of work made invisible by classification still circulates. Forced incarceration is coeval to labor without contract, but the contract is a legality, but the legal is a logic premised on crime, but crime is a racialized grammar that we learn as we build. Lost childhood is a ghost in every echo of public discourse. We look upon images accompanied with what we bring with us. Some images need coaxing from the archive. Some images need pause, a meditative withholding of their act, a mindful demonstration of what is present. Um, I started to write this uh, before my, my son was born. Um, and it was the anticipation of an experience where I was bringing uh, an, an anxiety I felt over a, what I perceived to be a negligence in, in history. Uh, and what I was seeing in my students, which was a uh, preoccupation with knowledge in the sense of um, it's difficult to make them understand or know anything unless they feel that they themselves have seen it. And, and this is really difficult when you're teaching literature and you're trying to also uh, teach history at the same time. Um, and it, it, it was a moment for pause in that I, you know, I am an immigrant. My son was going to be born an American citizen. Um, and that was meaningful to me because I didn't want my, my um, disposition toward national identity um, to be his, because I knew that his would be very different, and I knew that his experience was going to be very different. Um, but at the same time, there is there is a, a, a kind of work in in parenting that is also teaching, and so the, the, these these two kind of I suppose identities were were coming to a head. Me as teacher and or me as a parent. Um, and, and in both cases, not wanting to be heavy handed. Um, yeah, and, and, and you know, who knows the kind of job that I'm doing, but <laughs> anyway. Um, but this is, so the, the book kind of weaves the, these um, reflections on history, these reflections on the public, and you know, these, these sort of reflections on me as, as, a, as a parent. I was not prepared for my son's own act of defiance to this world to be gray at birth, to hold his breath, to pause upon his entry into this fortress, labyrinthing and confusing as to whose fingers will hold you and whose will want to squeeze you and convince the breath of its restriction. As if he looked upon this photograph with me and paused, holding himself by the diaphragm in anticipation of hearing the young black man scream out in some human actualization of order and sense not wanting his own breathing to obscure the photograph's rationale, evidence that the method of torture might not undo the project of humanity, which in the history of my son's own awareness, cultivating inside his mother's body, captures everything. The anticipation was like warfare, I imagine, though one where you are either unarmed, holding nothing but another person, or your own self, or where you hold a weapon you don't know how to use with nothing but a determination that is life itself, tied to an object you might creatively subvert, as if to say, improvise with, if not for being bound to it. My son pushes a small plastic lawnmower so that bubbles are coaxed from a spinning yellow sprocket. The faster he pushes it, the more excited the bubbles seem to float into the light bursting into the palms of maple leaves, forming a canopy above the scene of us, him pushing, me watching, our life blurring at the edge of becoming an aesthetic predicament. He pushes his lawnmower until his skin 
rose becomes rosed and it seems to glow to me. One time a student asked if I would feel the same if I were white and I said, but I'm not. Stone, beam, pillar, slab. It takes shape, what gets burned. It is a shape more honest than the form impressed on it before it burns. After time, the impression is a city. I'm told is also my own. I'm told it is mine and of my making. I burn it as the only way out of its cast. It becomes unclear how much I want or don't want the inhabitants of the city to be real. The fantasy is confusing and is a confusion of the image that is the electricity which becomes part of the very gumminess I'm told is me. At one point, this gumminess was painted according to a pinwheel of differing shades of skin tone. Then it became a pinwheel of degrees of emotion. The pinwheel contains hieroglyphics of bodies in different contortions I assume are commands. I assume the expectation to teach my son for the moment the wheel addresses him. The legality and history of anti-blackness is a gnarled site of my own identity as a Central American immigrant, a naturalized citizen of America. To render metaphor within this situation such that the outcome resembles meaning, which is otherwise unrendered in the systemic manner of acknowledging others. This is to slow starvation down until there is an asymptotic vacuum, the chaotic and excited atomic state and the holding pattern of such impossible intimacy brings with it the awakening of feeling at each near catastrophic utterance spoken into anarchy feeling while extending closer and closer towards a threshold into true nothingness. I am elaborated in this space, along with my shame in erasing the reality of my child and my spouse. So too is my pleasure in rendering the metaphor that aggravates the distinction of our unions. My emotional exhaustion is an exhaustion over the order of words. I prefer to let them spin around. It is investigation. Leading up to my son's birth, I became obsessed with the history of racial categorization in the Americas called casta. When I look upon hogtied or photos of riots, of defense, of casual and banal violence, of buildings, of bodies, of skylines. I sense we still practice casta in North America, even if the words we call to each other and pass along like stones and slabs have changed, especially because of the way optics play a role in equating the aesthetic scene to an objective scenery. When we dance in a circle, I sense the anticipation of crashing to the floor as an excitement of disorder and the invitation to touch someone I love deeply. The image turns it to brush and the song to syncopation. Convinced before all the heavenly angels and the screen through which song projects with blurred echoing boundaries that there is no childhood, no age, no voice, no status with which to declare no no recollection and no iteration, no life which the courts proceed with examples and history. Um, and thank you. I think that's all I have. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so we're gonna, thanks, Jose. That's great. Um, well now, turn things over to uh, Monica de la Torre, but first I'm gonna play back this intro and hopefully this time you'll see it. I, um, I got word that um, maybe you didn't see the video. Um, so I'm going to try this again. It said I was sharing my screen. Um, okay, is everyone seeing this? Okay, so thank you. This was a, this, uh, I was hoping you would see Elias last time too, but instead you got a glimpse of my notes apparently. So, 
Um, okay, but here we are again. Um, so thank you again, Elias, for this introduction, and then you'll hear from Monica. A professor at Brooklyn College, Monica de la Torre was born and raised in La Ciudad de Mexico, Mexico. De la Torre's upcoming project, Repetition 19, is published by Nightbolt Books and will be arriving this year, 2020. As we gather in this virtual and public space, we unfortunately reconsider the vulnerability of our physical bodies and their relationship to spatial dimensions. Our heightened awareness of the economy of space registers much deeper than six feet apart. In one particular poem, an aspiring lifeguard replies to a bather's question that I thought I writes, my vision is blurry at all distances. My corneas have flat and steep areas. Likewise, my mind. The poetry of Monica de la Torre subverts the very real and physical architectural modalities of oppressive systems. The symbolic distance between chairs and bureaucratic settings, migrations from homes, trains, highways, La Federal 95 de, you're surrounded by nomads going somewhere. There is a purpose to their movement, writes de la Torre. This work covers distances. It uncovers distance and grants us access to a more sacred place. Es un gran honor presentar a Monica de la Torre. And so, uh, no, Monica, thank you. Thank you so much. I wish Elias was here so I could thank him at least remotely. Um, hi, everybody. It's really good to be here. Um, well, no, it isn't actually. <laughs> it's not good to be here. It's good to be in this space between where you are and where I am. Uh, who knows where we are? I'm clearly, yeah, this is really taking me away from here and that's a beautiful thing. Thank you so much, uh, Mike, for making this happen and for really sticking it out. And um, I'm glad we stayed with the original plans because it looks like this will be the new normal for the foreseeable future. So, um, yes. Hi, Peter. Uh, um, and hi, everybody. I will get started because um, yet yeah, time drags on when you're on these devices. And um, I'll just say that Repetition 19 is out. It officially came out a couple days ago. Um, I will be reading from it. It has a few sections. I will begin with the first section and then I'll read you some translations. Uh, but before I, no, I'll, I'll just get started. Um, isometry. Gaze turned on gaze. Positioned in front of the groove between mirror panels. Split wobbling at the edges of both frames during tree pose, particularly. A translation is moving every point of a shape the same distance in the same direction. Not ambidextrous, I keep silent. I understand the dilemma of playing protagonist, prefer a supporting role, the only part of your body remaining undisciplined, detached, I am disobedient, writes my left hand. Unlike nostos, algo is unspecified. Nunca sé por dónde empezar, así que decido hacerlo al comerme una fresa. Incontable la cantidad de semillas. Can you say I'm of two minds? Yo diría que tengo ideas encontradas, lo cual abre dos posibilidades, que se encuentren como amigas, cada una con su punto de vista, hace tanto que no se ven, o que estén a punto de agarrarse. Getting at each other's throats. Pensé que era un mexicanismo, pero no. You're getting territorial, lo cual a ti nunca te preocupa. What are you talking about? Si lo que dices o no es un regionalismo, te tienes sin cuidado, no te define. Since I'm just passing through, you mean. Pero te fuiste quedando. I went on staying. Who's I anyway? ¿Quién habla? I, I. Interjección para expresar muchos y muy diversos movimientos del ánimo y más ordinariamente aflicción o dolor. I, pronounced I. Interjection used to express a range of mood shifts and more commonly affliction or pain. 
I never know where to begin, so I pick up a strawberry with its countless seeds. Como dices, tengo ideas encontradas. I am of two minds. Como si en tu cerebro se alojaran dos mentes. Or your skull had a Siamese twin. Lo cual te haría excepcional. But it's a set phrase. The language figurative or formulaic. It's referent a common affliction. Me hiciste pensar en referis. Who plays arbiter is up for grabs. Volvemos a los agarrones. Don't get ahead of yourself. Volvemos a las cabezas. Ahead, not ahead. ¿Por qué no dices la verdad? Te pierdes en tus juegos de palabras. You interrupted me. Up for grabs, to be for the taking. O sea, disponible. You misinterpret to get your point across. I, pronounced I, primera persona singular en inglés. I, pronounced I, first person singular. It follows that algo, an indeterminate something from the Latin, is unrelated to algos, pain in Greek. De ahí se desprende que algos, del griego, poco tiene que ver con algo, del latín. The rest, there's no need to spell out. Discontinuous repetition. You'd like to keep things simple, elemental. Avoid tying yourself into knots over what you can't come to grips with. Dark drives, miscalculations, the facts around the clock. Or else, arrange your twined strands into arresting patterns. Or else, the ring of those two words roping you in. Roped off is the alternative, but you know it's pointless to keep things separate. Pretend you are given enough rope. What will you do with it next? Rope a dope? While you consider options, I salute how quietly you define you defy flatness, your multi-purpose materiality. Who's you, by the way? It's difficult to say. I tangles up easily. The incidental beauty of non-objects. A reluctant shaman in the guise of a nuisance, a screeching child, promises to purge us subway riders of our general discontent. Let the wind of change speak through his squalls and babble. Dada. Think of it as anti-poetry produced by tiny but sturdy windpipes. He too embraces the formless, rejects the regime. Mobilized is the experience of confusion where the familiar is made unfamiliar and vice versa. A woman massaged by her partner on the subway platform. His fists hot stones. You're a scared animal. Did I mishear that? Stone in Korean is also anniversary. Precious stones are reminders, but other types of petrifaction commemorate the past too, change it into object. Take stones dangling from a wood beam. They appear yielding through sheer optical effect. On the opposite end of the spectrum are monuments. Puddles undo their monumentality, turn statues and towers into shimmering surfaces on the sidewalk. It's slippery outside. Hovering cautiously, we too negotiate between gravity's pull and our vertical aspirations. A mirrored image is a non-material photograph, an event. The same goes for the choreography of banners waving in the air. They announce nothing but an otherwise invisible presence. It's audible though, as if chasing away something. Earworms for one. What the wind has to say today it says only in passing. Boxed in. Heads up. False friends use familiarity as camouflage. In the source language, deciduous might be confused with apathy, but nothing could be further away from decidia than, than the timed impermanence of leaves. Yes, even forests engage in a form of family planning. We took for granted the tree outside our window until it failed to bud. A ginkgo, they cut it down when the building across the street went up. Since our view is limited, we'd like to imagine the situation from the missing tree's perspective. Given the recent turn of events, it might have resisted blooming. It was protesting its decorative use to boost property values. Or perhaps after millennia of honing its particulars, it refused the magic of tree-lined streets. Concrete blocks these social beings' access to fungal networks, prevents the roots from interconnecting. 
Are you a reluctant loner like the specimens that surround us here today? I hope you understand I do not mean to ruin the relationship. Divagar. It has an, uh, an epigraph by Lynn Hijinian. There's a lot of waiting in the drama of experience. No signal from the interface except for a frozen half-bitten fruit. Other than that, no logos. An hour is spent explaining to the group what I've forgotten to do with the mistranslation of a verb that means drifting but can imply deviance. The next hour goes by trying to remember in the back of my mind the name of the artist who makes paintings on ink jets. Why I think of him escapes me. Now my gaze circles a yoga bun of the tall woman in front of me. I didn't pay $20 to contemplate the back of her head. It's killing me. The pillars and plaster saints with their tonsures floating amid electronic sound waves. At such volume, they could crumble. The virgin safe in a dimly lit niche as the tapping on my skull and the clamor of bones or killer bees assaults this repurposed church. This is what I sought. While in another recess, I keep hearing Violeta Parra's Volver a los 17 and 17 year olds marching against the nonsense of arming teachers. If I were an instrument, a bassoon. In the source language, we do not say spread the word. Pasa la voz is our idiom, easily mistaken for a fleeting voice. From the back row, all I see is fingers gliding in sync with her vocalizations. How fitting a last name like Halo. Lucky for us here, time is measure and inexplicable substance. That's when I decide to stop fighting the city, use it in my favor, speak to strangers, demolish the construct in the performance. Error is boundless. We tried using tally marks instead for seeming more discreet. While adding them up, one of us kept texting the other one of us, sending photos of bright green cakes with rings of pink icing on their edges and trios of blue flowers adorning their tops. Single digit price tags sticking out from toothpicks as if for birthdays pre-1999. Soon it got challenging to keep count while referring to each number as a number that is one more than the previous number indefinitely. A lemon yellow cake appeared on screen and it became evident progression would only lead back to the beginning. One is a version of unus, oinus. In other words, listen to us. Two mirrors tu, and also. When a single unit is no longer the case, one becomes reciprocal, a second person. At the end of you and me, three becomes expected, except when misread. Trie or treo, gender dependent. God, a prisoner or king, laughing away. What to make of thief and fief of oil lamps, especially as in quinques and pent up. I skipped four, quatre, squatter, since four is for all when being walled off. Timestamp, 4 p.m. I meant not to demonstrate, but to delve into the full expression of the form, yet it kept emptying out, becoming non-tiered. So I'm just going to read you um, a few self-translations and assisted translations and collaborative translations in uh, the second part of the book, which contains 25 different translations of the same poem uh, that I wrote in Spanish uh, more, more time ago than I care to remember, let's just say around two decades ago. And the poem in Spanish had nothing to do with translation, but I called it equivalencias. And as I uh, went on with my life and uh, occasionally translated from the Spanish, translated other poets, sometimes uh, from the Portuguese, I, people would ask me why I didn't translate myself. And um, I think I'm still thinking about why I don't translate myself straightforwardly because it's kind of boring and it's also tempting to revise and revisit and do things all over again start from scratch. So this is what this series is a result of, like rewriting the poem according to different translation methodologies 25 different times. So um, I'm going to read you just a couple of them. 
Then the third section of the book has notes um, about translation and riffs off of the translation process or something else depending on the specific translation. So I'm just gonna read you a couple of them and I'm gonna read you one of the notes. So um, let's see, the, one of the translations, I don't know if you can see this, but it looks like this. So essentially the English is on top of the Spanish and it's a sound poem and I'll do my best to do it now. Equivalences, equivalences. One, uno, a silence, un silencio, a flare, una llamarada, un sip of coffee before, antes de, it tasted bitter, supiera amargo, a sip in a hole, un hoyo, dentro de un agujero, two roads, caminos, a rear, a pair of eyes, la siesta trayectoria, how many mirrors are two, cuantos espejos, night falls, cae la tarde y aparecen dos luces, going on three, ya son tres, three is peace and a pledge, una cómplice, un cómplice, an enemigo, three grains of salt, four times I said, Remember nothing, four is the same as two, cuatro es lo mismo que dos. Y si cinco veces, you speak, ask yourself preguntas, what am I doing here? Set your bed on fire, deja la arder, let it burn, and split, y vete. Okay. This other translation is called equivalent equivalence. A mute flare-up, a sip of coffee before the bitter one knew about it. A hole inside a hole two roads and a pair of sleeping eyes. How many mirrors are there too? The afternoon tumbles and two lights pop out. Two children passing as two. Three space guarantee the promise of a complex and an enemy. Three open books, three grams of salt. I said four asterisks and named nothing. What is the same as yet? Yeah, Five times you wonder what I do here. Light your bed on fire, let it combust and divide itself. And then there's another translation. I'll, I'll read you the note of this one at the end. There's another translation called The Big Beautiful Wall. And for this translation, what I did was, uh, apropos of the title, which has nothing to do with equivalence, um, I decided I would follow up on some idiotic comment that someone told me many, many, many years ago when I started translating. And they said, oh, your, your translations have too many. I mean, maybe it wasn't as idiotic, I'm sorry. But this person said to me, there's too many Latinates in your poem. I think you should actually get rid of all the Latinates because it makes your, this translation seem like a translation. So you should actually eliminate the Latinates so that it sounds as if you wrote it in the original, as if it was originally written in English. And, um, and yeah, the, the idea being that a good translation ought to pass for the original or ought to pass for something originally written in the language, in, this, in the target language, in other words. So this translation is in honor of that person and it's called The Big Google Wall. And it, only, it eliminates any word from the translation from the original that, um, would have Latinates. The only words allowed into this poem have Anglo-Saxon roots. A big, beautiful wall. One, no din, a flash, a sip of a hot drink made from roasted and ground seeds found bitter after swallowing. A bottomless pit. Twofold roads, one path, and shut eyes awake. Two looking glasses are how many? With dusk come lights. Two children, now three. Three is oath, is stillness, a chum, a foe. Three truths, three lies. Four times the speaker said nothing. Four and two are the same. Having asked five times why she'd stay there, she set the bed on fire and left, letting it burn. So of course, coffee cannot be in the poem and also the word peace and silence had to be eliminated. Um, so now I will end with the note on the poem Equivalent Equivalence. And uh, will that, that, that will end my reading. On September 19th, 1923, an excerpt of a letter by Alfred Stieglitz was published in the Amateur Photographer under, under the title how I came to photograph clouds. He writes, I wanted to photograph clouds to put down what I had found out in 40 years about photography. Through clouds to put down my philosophy of life, 
to show that my photographs were not due to subject matter, not to special trees or faces or interiors, to special privileges. Clouds were there for everyone, no tax on them yet, free. Stieglitz's series of cloud photographs is titled Equivalence from 1925 to 1931. It proposes equivalence between cloud formations and once fluctuating states of mind. In this sense, clouds are not unlike translations. The process by which one thing becomes akin to another is always already open-ended, never definitive. An equation is an abstraction and its variables can always be redefined. Imagine that in one version, we only become aware of feeling when looking at clouds and discovering that they mirror what we experience within. In another version, we look for clouds that mirror what we feel and ignore those that do not match. In yet another version, we focus only on the clouds that we can't associate with anything, for they're the true measures of our inwardness and the unpredictability of our moods. Through photographic alchemy, despite his staunch allegiance to straight photography, Stieglitz converts the ethereal into perceptual objectivity and back, regardless of the nebulosity of its subjects. The equivalent series is a record of our attempts to find correspondences, of our once commonly shared dream to attain spiritual symbiosis with nature. We look up to the sky and we are leveled, made equivalent. The cloud is on demand and available to all. Imagine this as a form of pathetic fallacy. Cumulus tumble onto the afternoon sky. At sundown, a bed of clouds flares up and turns blood red before fading into the night. Hoy, el aire no manifestaba ausencia de movimiento aparente, pero lo contrario de la calma tampoco se presentaba de manera visible. Por el momento, el cielo se encontraba despejado, pero la inexactitud del pronóstico estaría por verificarse. El día a medias estaba. Se aproximaba un pseudo frente cálido y la troposfera daba la sensación de que se podía tocar. Seis octavos del cielo estaban cubiertos de nubes entrecortadas. La decisión tendría que ser tomada independientemente de las condiciones climatológicas, pues ni siquiera se vislumbraban las implicaciones de interiorizar un cielo aborregado, una nube pared o una nube en coma, ni hablar de una nube de escombros. Se encontraría en rotación ciclónica, hiciera lo que hiciera, la micro ráfaga estaba por comenzar. Del cielo poco le llovería. Um, that was meant to be accompanied by a on-spot translation that would have uh, been produced by Google, but that didn't happen. Um, so just to end, I will end with a translation of a different poet that's folded into the book, and it is a translation of Vallejo. Trilce, it's Trilce 36. And it's, um, it's dedicated to Miguel de Cervantes uh, for multiple reasons we can talk about later. But um, here is 36 in my version of it. We strive to go through a needle's eye at loggerheads bent on winning. The circle's fourth angle almost ammoniifies itself. The male going on female due to probable breasts and precisely due to that which won't bloom. Are you there, Venus of Milo? You're barely impaired and trailed within the plenary arms of existence, of this existence still hoisting perennial imperfection. Venus of Milo, whose severed, uncreated arm twists and tries to elbow itself through greening, gurgling pe pebbles, rising now tilly, yet that have just started crawling immortal eaves, lassoer of the imminent, lassoer of parentheses, refuse, and you as well, to set foot on the twofold security of harmony. Refuse symmetry for sure. Intervene in the conflict of ends battling in the most heated of jousts to leap through the needle's eye. And so I feel my pinky as an add-on to my left hand. I see it and suppose it is not me or at least that it is where it shouldn't be. And this enrages me and vexes me, and there's no way I out except pretending that today is Thursday. Yield to the new odd, potent with orphanhood.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and thanks again, Jose. Um, and thanks again to everyone here. So um, this is a, a packed room, but it might be nice to open it up for some questions if people have any. Um, so we can um, unmute, um, but perhaps to uh, make this workable, um, if those who will be, maybe we can begin with those who are visible and please don't feel obligated to turn your video on. We will uh, make it a point to get to everybody. Those who are visible, you want to say something, you have a question, um, maybe raise your hand, just like physically raise your hand. Um, and then, and I see you, thank you, yes, great. Um, and then we'll move on to those who are not visible. There is, if you see it, a hand raise function. Um, like a little like raise hand that should be down on the sides on the sidebar so hopefully that's there for you um, otherwise um, if you don't see that we'll figure something out but we will get to those of you who don't want to turn your video on um, so let's see oh, are we, oops. oh. We all unmuted? Hello? Um, so what we may do so what I've done is allow you to um, Sorry, hold on. Let me mute. We're unmuted now. Okay. What I will do is um, unmute you. Sorry, I hit the wrong button. I will unmute you one at a time. Um, uh, I meant to, meant to hit the wrong. Okay. So anyway, so yes, uh, those who are visible and have questions. Sorry, raise uh, raise a hand. Yes. Okay. Great. Hello. Um, oh. I'm pressing unmute, but it's not working. Okay, sorry. Unmute audio. Can you unmute yourself by chance? Um, Lisa, Ain. okay, there you are. Hello. Hi there. Um, I'm a language teacher, have been for many, many years, and uh, I was curious to wonder what ages you were when you immigrated or when you came, because you have zero note of any, Spanish in your English language. You gotta unmute. Um, Here we go. Oh. Uh, I was I was quite young. Um, the situation was that my mother did not speak English, uh, and so <laughs> she made my brother and I watch a lot of TV. <laughs> well, how old were you? Um, I was about a year. My brother was uh, two. Um, you know, our first our first language was Spanish and remained Spanish. Um, you know, and this is something that we're learning with our our own son, who we're raising bilingual. Um, you know, the house is 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 Spanish or multilingual, but the world is English, uh, and and so such was our world. So, you know, you're giving him a gift. Yeah, uh, we hope. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, and how about you, Monica? I I I came here uh, after college, but my mother's American, uh, so I grew up in Mexico, and and I mean I was there always. But uh, when I was very very young, my mother actually didn't speak Spanish. She was learning Spanish, so I think I first learned English through her. So it, it's, it's possible that my first words were actually in English and not in Spanish, even though I was there. And then as I, as I grew up, um, and my, I'm the oldest of a family of four siblings, and so English began getting dropped as, as we aged. Mm -hmm. We didn't really, we, we really were uncomfortable speaking English at home or out on the street with my mom. It was really embarrassing, so. Right. Yeah. Well, it's very interesting to me, just uh, I've, my observations over many years are that if you come or make that change at 11 or younger, mm -hmm. there will be no accent. And if you come at 12 or mm -hmm. older, that you will probably have an accent your whole life. But the pertinence that I'm asking about is when you write poetry, does one language lead? Does it always blend? Mm -hmm. Um, it, I think it depends um, what what I'm what I'm writing. I think things that are um, 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 you know reflection or memoir. You know, I 
I, I kind of go between writing in Spanish, which to me is, is closer to memory um, than it is perhaps to intellectualizing. And when I, when I find myself intellectualizing, I find myself uh, writing in English. Um, when I find myself writing citationally, this occurs English. When I find writing uh, locatively or again, mnemonically, that, that tends to occur in Spanish, yeah. Yeah, interesting. Uh, for me, mainly I've been writing in English for for a while. Like, I mean, I've been, I've been here for a number of decades now. So now I mainly write in English, but I cannot tell stories. Bless you. <laughs> I, that's so funny. So yeah, it's 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 safe. We're we're at a safe distance. It's it's just allergies, by the way. Um, what was I going to say? Uh, I I don't think I can tell stories in English. I know that. So if I were a fiction writer, which I am not, but if I were to write fiction, I, I'm pretty certain I couldn't possibly do it in English. I, I would do it in Spanish. And everything else right now is, is basically, yeah, critical work I can do in English, poetry I can do in English, um, but With your heart. prose, not prose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Narrative prose. Mm -hmm. <gasps> We can't hear you. Can you hear me? I'm unmuted. I have to mute unmute myself. Right. Um, here I, I, you know. All right. Uh, so thank you, Lisa. Um, the uh, anyone, anyway. So okay. Um, show of hands. Who else has a question that they would like to? Okay. So I see Andy. I see Bethany. <gasps> and I'll look at it, take an inventory. So Andy Moss. Yes. Okay. You are um, unmuted. <laughs> Okay, uh, I hope you can hear me. I, I thought that both of you, um, you, you know, a lot of, a lot of the, the interchange of the two languages was, was central to what you were uh, talking about and thinking about. Uh, but I, I, I had a very simple question for Mo Monica, which I didn't understand the term Latinates. And I, I wondered if she could, uh, Ex explicate that a little bit. Right. So those would be the words that etymologically come from Latin in English. So, so say, I mean, there are so many words like um, uh, fabrication is a Latinate because it comes from the Latin and not, okay. not from Old English or yeah, Anglo-Saxon or German or yeah. So Latinates normally are like any, any word that is is a cognate to a word in a romance language uh -huh. it tends to be a latinate so and how often, do the, so so how what do, happens is that often there are um, synonyms with different roots that to some people sound more like english they don't sound foreign so are you sense? saying those are spanish words latinates or are, are there latinates in both spanish and, and english Yes. Well, Latinate applies to only English words. So actually, so, so, so my, my critique of that comment that I received is that it, it omits the fact that half of the English language, I don't know the percentage, but half of the English language, I mean, these are English language words. They just have a different root. Okay. Uh, this idea that somehow real English is Anglo-Saxon and not Latinate, corresponds with very, uh, you know, it's like corresponds with ideas that come from like the beginning of the 20th century, late 19th century, eugenics, the straightforward, like really racist views of what the American identity or even like, yeah, the Anglo identity is. Mm -hmm. But it's really misguided because um, for instance, the Kim's, King James's Bible was all Latinates. They thought the Anglo-Saxon words sounded too gruff. So they thought that elegant, like an, a more elegant writing style in English consisted mainly of Latinates. Which, so this thing, this debate just goes back and forth. But essentially, English contains roots. Uh, in the English language has words from all kinds of different 
um, etymological backgrounds and Latinates are part of it. Uh -huh. Yeah, so yeah. if you had to avoid them, you, you would actually have a quite impoverished vocabulary. Right. Like the word vocabulary is one of them, for instance. Oh. That's Latin. <laughs> yeah, vocabulario. That's a Latin. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Is that I do. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. You're welcome. And I enjoyed, I, I wanted to say this to Woodland Pattern also, um, that I, I've enjoyed this opportunity tonight, um, given that we're all sort of locked in our houses and, and all that. And it's it's been really, really wonderful to have a way to uh, have some experiences with some other people mm -hmm. around some um, feeling and thoughtful um, areas. So thanks to Woodland Pattern. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, okay. Th yeah, very much, Andy. I'm going to mute you again. And I know Bethany has been waiting. Hi, Bethany. We're going to unmute Bethany. Okay. Um, oh, there we go. Bethany? Hello? Hi. Hi. Do you hear me? Yeah. Oh, cool. Cool. Hi. Um, hello from Hawaii. I was a little late to the reading because of the time difference, but um, I had a question for both Jose and Monica. Um, what are the most, do you have any living poets that are especially influential to you both? And I'm wondering who those people are. Yeah, um, I was trying to figure out why it was so sunny where you are. Yeah, it's uh, pretty, pretty, pretty great. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, you know, um, uh, I really, I really am, am uh, invested in the work of Myung Mi Kim. You know, mm -hmm. I find that that's, that's poetry that I can return to uh, mm -hmm. fairly, very often uh, and each time um, feel that I'm getting something out of it. Um, you know, I, I think that there are um, poets that, that I, um, that I have corresponded with that, 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 that I feel, uh, um, are, you know, Cecilia Vicuña, for instance, you know, uh, her work was really important for me when I was a graduate student. Uh, and, you know, when I first started to, um, you know, in, in my job and, you know, but more, more than that, I think her, her, her outlook on the relationship of aesthetics in the world is, is what has been really valuable to me. Yeah. You know? well, thank you. Good to know. How about you, Monica? Hi. Hi. Hawaii sounds like a great, a good place to be on in, in lockdown, actually. Yeah, it's really it's a great place to be in lockdown. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, I mean, I don't, there's so many people, so many people, and some, some maybe are, are contemporary, but not, are not alive. Mm. Um, like C.D. Wright, for instance. Mm. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking of Rosemary Waldrop, Cecilia Vicuña, too, super important to me. Uh, Norbeze Philip, Peter Gizzi, who's here somewhere. Um, uh, Rodrigo Toscano, Urayo Anoel, Amanda Berenguer. Amanda Berenguer is this incredible Uruguayan poet who died only three or four years ago. And she has a book in English that Ugly Duckling Press put, put out a year ago. It took a really long time to edit those translations. There's like 10 different translators. The book is called Materia Prima, like, yeah, prime matter, Materia Prima. She is absolutely phenomenal. She died at 80 something from Uruguay, incredible poet. She was like Neo Baroque, but she was also a concrete poet. Um, Ashbery, I mean, way too many people to mention. There's, I just, I, I feel like um, today, today we had a workshop um, also super kindly facilitated by Woodland Pattern. Um, it would have been there, but because of Zoom, we were able to um, have a poet join us from Venice, Italy. Wow. She participated in the workshop. And I was just thinking of the, she, she had interned at Ugly Duck and Press. She loves American poetry and knows more about American poetry than Italian poetry. And I, I was just thinking to me, just, Living poet, U.S. poetry and the environment, the ecology of American poetry today is so thriving. It's it's just so rich and wonderful and diverse, varied that I, I every every single 
person who is participating in this ecology for me is someone worth reading and and influences me if i read them i mean i, I don't know everything right yeah of course. Just, of course. yeah yeah it's it's hard to pick one or two you know one or two people it's just like it's it's so vibrant i feel very lucky mm -hmm. thank you so much um Okay, and now we'll see if we, oh yeah, um, hold on a second. I see Peter um, on mute. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you both for your reading. Uh, it was really lovely to uh, just bring some poetry into my house and some company. But um, Jose, you mentioned Myung Mi Kim. Monica, you mentioned C.D. Wright. So my question is, how do you guys feel about situating your work in relation to a kind of documentary poetics? You kind of both come to it in a different way. Monica, through ling linguistics and these declarative phrases that are ubiquitous and then how you turn them. And then Jose, how you were dealing with kind of just documented information of, um, you know, atrocity. So it, do you think of yourself as documentary poets or do you think about being a documentary poet or I'm just curious. I mean, I wouldn't shy away from from the idea of docu poetics, um, and you know, just just kind of corresponding with uh, with Craig Santos Perez, who's really you know you know pushing for docu poetics. You know, the, there there's definitely a lot of a lot of similarities. I, you know, I you know I I don't feel like what I'm doing is as um, committed to you know any one particular document. Um, you know, like a book like Anti Humboldt. Or something like this, or even you know Emro Beze Philip, who's who's looking at a very specific archive. Um, but I, I I very much use archival material. I very much use found documents. Um, you know, but but I I I also you know wish to reflect on them and kind of break out of of that kind of of the lens, I suppose, or or break out of that framework uh, and move around a little bit. But yeah, I mean you know when you think about uh, early examples of docu poetics like factography and sort of the Russian avant gardists that were doing this, you know, I think there's a there is a kinship with especially Asian Russians that were using factography to sort of push back against the the kind of like Westernization of Russian identity and this Europeanization of Russian identity by by using census material and photography to reveal that hey, you know, Russia is also Asian. Um, I do. Think that my my use of documents, photography, archive, etc., is is very similar in pointing to um, you know these 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 identities that are latent within um, found text and documents that are not um, that are not foregrounded and how we, and how we treat those documents. Um, so so I would I would yeah yeah y yes <laughs> <How's that? laughs> yeah I'm into it. Hmm. Um, that's a really interesting question, Peter, because I don't think of myself as someone who does that. I mean, I love documentary poetics. I feel that mm, my projects in general tend to scramble modalities to a degree. And um, as much as I respect that mode, um, rarely do my projects have the consistency um, and narrow, like the, 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 the focus really like the, yeah, the, fo the focus, um, not that they're unfocused. It's just, i like to rub things together and, and see what emerges out of that juxtaposition of modalities and materials, et cetera. But I do think that there's a way in which I can engage documentary, a uh, documentary mode by situating the work that I do. So I feel that one of the things that inevitably is just not even like a conceptual premise or conceit, it's just merely the result of a certain tendency to ground the material in its specific conditions of production. So for instance, when I was working on these translations, I was at a residency in California and one day they wanted to show us the grounds and do a little tour and we do the tour and it's like oh whoa it turns out that this beautiful mansion in northern california 
has a very shady, shady, shady history. The guy who left to bequeath it to the county and then San Francisco was a senator whose re-election campaign ran on the slogan, Keep California White. He, he was friends with Madison Grant, loved Madison Grant, the man who wrote The Passing of the Great Race. He was one of the main advocates for the, um, what was not that he didn't have anything to do with the Chinese Exclusion Act, but he's, his work led to the Japanese, the, like everything that the Japanese uh, went through after the Second World War, even though he was working in the 20s. So I, I'm like, here I am working on translation, on my translations in a place that has this history and I had to find a way to respond to it. Mm -hmm. I couldn't just pretend like I wasn't there. But I also didn't want then the project to become all about this man. So I needed, it took me a really long time to figure out how to have that enter the piece. And it actually did through um, a number of the translations and then the notes, which I didn't read today, but one of the notes to A Big Beautiful Wall says where these translations were done. I was also very close to Google. I was, I was like very close to Silicon Valley. So it deals with technological biases as well. So in that way, those tendrils do kind of approach a documentary mode but but then i move on to um to 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 up to tackle other subjects too mm -hmm. i just wanted to finish up monica and said that you should translate all of trill say i think mm -hmm, i'm starting to feel inclined to do that yeah i would like to i mean clay national is a wonderful they're okay yeah, they're they're wonderful, they're, they're great. But i think the best translation is many translations exactly i agree mm -hmm. yeah i agree Thank yeah. you both. Thank you. Oh, th there I am, unmuted. Thank you, Peter. Um, uh, so as I said, I do want to give those who maybe are not um, visible but might have questions a chance. Um, so is there anybody who is uh, does not have their video on, has a question, sees the little hand raise function, would like to raise their digital hand. It like a sort of makes a little blue icon on your, um, not seeing anyone. No. Carl. <laughs> Where? Second page, maybe. Hmm, interesting, I'm missing. Let me look, oh, oh. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not seeing. You're seeing somebody. I see a an icon. Maybe it's just his, you know, placeholder. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. Big blue K. Um. Oh, the K. I see. No. Yeah. That's. Uh. Thank you for that. Yeah. That's something different. It like looks like a little hand, like a little tiny hand. Anyway. Um. So I'm not seeing anybody. Um, and, and hey, what a wonderful note to end on. Um, it was a great question and it was good hearing from both of you. Um, and thank you so, so much, uh, Monica de la Torre and thank you, Jose Felipe Alvergue and thanks to all of you for sharing this space in lieu of a physical space. Um, of course, not the same, but it's so wonderful to see you all and I like being invited into some of your houses too, so thanks for that. And <laughs> Some people probably participated that might not have otherwise. Yeah, yeah, um, certainly. Hawaii. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> That's cool. Um, but thank you all, and um, and come see us again here for the time being, and hopefully again soon in person in Milwaukee at Woodland Pattern Book Center. Okay. Um, good night. Thank you so much. Thank you so thank much. You. Great to read with you. Likewise. Thank you. Bye. Really, really cool. Bye. Bye. Bye.